Hey guys, in this video I interview someone named Stevie. Stevie is an absolute exemplar when it comes to immersion learning. He taught himself English to a near native level in around six years while living in Germany, and for the past three years he's been totally focused on learning Japanese. At the 18th month mark he passed the JLPT N1 and around the same time filmed a video of himself speaking pretty fluent Japanese, which you can find on his YouTube channel, link in the description. <laughs> I think this interview is going to be really insightful and motivating to you guys, so I really hope you enjoy. Hey guys, today I have Stevie on with me. How's it going, Stevie? Fine, and you? Yeah, pretty good. I'm really excited to talk to you because, yeah, you're one of the most well known success stories within the uh, immersion learning community. And, you know, most people know you for learning Japanese to a really high level really quickly. But before we go into that, I'd be really interested to kind of hear your story with regards to how you learned English, because English is really the first、uh, foreign language that you learned, right? Yeah, yeah, it's the first one. And, well, I had French in school as well, but I never was really good at it.、Um, yeah, English for, I guess, if I remember correctly, six years in school. But I was still really bad at the end and I was unable to read anything or understand anything while listening. And those six years w a s from when to when? Around 12 to 18, if I remember everything correctly. It has been a while. So, yeah, in school, like most people in Germany, we have English. Not everyone. Like I said, French is also a possibility. And yeah, afterwards, I was still unable to do anything with it. And the only thing that helped me to progress was starting to read. I started to read because I got interested in nutrition and training. And there were a lot of the websites I read online were in English. And the, if they recommend any books or so, they are in English as well. So I started slowly reading with easier books. And not, not that I did it consciously because I wanted to, it was just most of the time if you start something, you don't like the difficult scientific books. You start with a simpler topic. And so I did it there as well. And over time, it became more difficult. And later on, The first time I really noticed that I got good in English was when I had to write my first thesis in my first degree. And I wrote,、uh, read studies and I was able to understand them without a problem. And that was the first time I thought, oh my God, I got good in English. I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, so that's really interesting. So as you were getting better and better at English, you weren't really coming at it from the perspective of trying to get good. It was really just a tool that you were using to consume the information you wanted. And the natural byproduct was that you got really fluent. Yeah, exactly. Just focus, just because I wanted to understand what is written there and not because I wanted to learn English. And I think, as at least I felt a little bit during Japanese, trying to ignore that you're, trying, that you're learning a language and just trying to consume and enjoy what you're consuming can help a lot. Just forget that you're trying to learn anything and it happens on the side, so to speak. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and it fits in with Stephen Krashen's input hypothesis that basically says we learn the best when we're just focused on understanding messages and kind of delegating the process of trying to understand the language or, you know, break, understand the analytic part of the language to the subconscious mind, basically. Yeah, exactly. And so when you were reading in English, were you looking a lot of things up or were you mostly just inferring from context? Part, part.、Um... I read mo- a lot of my books. I-, I read about 20 in physical form, and I guess the same amount、uh, on the Kindle. And on the Kindle, I always looked the words up because in bu-、uh, Build Dictionary and so on, so it was pretty easy. I used it a lot when I was in the gym on the treadmill or so, reading for a few hours.、Um, there I looked it up, but always in German,、um, while reading books, physical books, less. Most of the time, I just read. Uh, depends on the、mm-hmm. amount of words. Maybe if it was a difficult、uh, word I needed to understand what they were talking about, I was looking it up, but otherwise I would just carry on and try to infer from context. And it worked. <laughs> cool, cool. And what about listening? Did you do a lot of listening as well? Yeah. Listening was, I guess, even more than reading.、Uh, after a while, I started watching YouTube channels on the topics and also started with probably a little bit simpler ones. And I always watched them on my second screen while I was playing video games or so. And sometimes for eight hours straight or so, different videos. And at first, like I said, all about training, nutrition, and so on. And later on, I branched out and whatever I wanted to. But that happened naturally and not because I wanted to. It was just 
I got something recommended on YouTube and I tried watching it and that's basically it. Yeah, so the YouTube algorithm, the addictive nature of the YouTube algorithm worked in your favor because it ended up being a more and more immersion. Yeah. That's cool. Kind of sounds like you were really almost all, all English all the time exemplar without <laughs> even knowing it, basically. Yeah, during that time, whenever somebody asked me um, when I was reading a book in English or so, why are you reading in English? My During that time, I always said my everyday life outside of work is 90% English. And that was really was the case. And it still is when I'm not uh, when I'm not reading uh, or immersing in Japanese. The rest I still do in English. If I want to watch news or something like that, um, then I watch them in English. Or I read websites, I read them in English. So that's outside of Japanese still the case. My German is probably getting worse <laughs> and worse, but <laughs> I don't really care. Yeah, so on that note, what about speaking? Because clearly here you're very comfortable in speaking English. So when did you start speaking and what was that like? The first one, okay, I started speaking, if you want to call it that, at work a little bit, but really only maybe four or five times. Because during my first degree, uh, I had to work at the same time. And maybe once a year or so, you get somebody who, is, who comes to the gym and wants to train. And they are not from Germany. They are from another European country. And most of them can speak English at least a little bit. So you can show them around and so on. And that happened maybe, like I said, in four years, four or five times. So if you want to call it, that was my first time speaking English. But the first time where I really spoke for a prolonged period of time is the first video on my ja uh, channel the six month <laughs> update video and that's the first time i really spoke for any amount of time longer than five minutes or so so that's the first one yeah so your it kind of sounds like your experience was similar to mine in japanese whereas i learned how to speak basically by just getting tons of input and then one day i tried to speak and i could speak and i wasn't perfect there was still some rough edges but i was completely fluent far better than people who try to speak from the beginning generally and very quickly i was able to refine it so in my case, it was kind of what I was expecting to happen because I had read the AJAT website and that's what uh, was written on there. But were you surprised when you found out that you were pr pretty much just seemingly magically became fluent in English without actually practicing speaking? It, w it was really interesting, um, but I never really thought a lot about it. I was just curious. Oh, I can understand it. I just whatever I'm listening to, I can follow it without a problem. And uh, but I can also speak, but I don't know why it just it just works. And <laughs> sometimes right now I think a little bit more about it, but during the first time when I was speaking, I never thought about it. It, was, it just happened. So I just accepted it. <laughs> cool, cool. So then now I'm finally moving on to, to learning Japanese. Did you initially think like, okay, I just got to do the same thing I did for English? Or did it take a while for you to really like, transfer over your method of learning English to a, the more intentional process of deciding that you're going to become fluent in Japanese? No, I, I I knew from the beginning, because when I decided I want to learn another language, I knew, and I still remembered from school, I hate traditional grammar study or traditional study in general. I can't stand it. That's why I was always pretty bad in school when it comes to la language classes, be it French or be it English. Uh, I already knew I want to go as fast through the basics as possible. So before I knew anything about kanji and so on, I just knew grammar or so on. I want to get it out of the way. So even if it's only at the basic level, I want to start reading. I want to start listening. And um, then that I can start immersing as much as possible without knowing that it's called immersion. So I just knew I want to read and listen. <laughs> that was my goal from the start. So I knew I want to go the immersion route. I just, at the time when I started, I had no real plan or real steps. I just knew immersion getting the basics away uh, out of the way as fast as possible. Cool. And and almost totally forgot to ask you, why did you decide to learn Japanese in the first place? So it sounds like for English, you just had material you wanted to consume. What made you decide to go after a foreign language more consciously? And why Japanese? <laughs> that was an interesting one. Um, I decided in the at the beginning of 2018, I decided I want to learn another language because up until that point, uh, most of my free time was playing video games and I decided, hey, I want to do something productive with my time. And the first one that came to my mind was Chinese mm -hmm. because it seemed like a good idea. You can use it in the workplace, maybe if you're lucky. And um, yeah, I went to a Chinese class at least once because it was free and... 
afterwards I decided no that's not for me <laughs> because as soon as they started talking about the tones and I, no that's isn't for me it's too complicated I don't want to do that because I thought if I have really have to concentrate on all the tones and up and down that's too much work for me so no I'm not going to do that and about two weeks later or so once again YouTube <laughs> I got a video recommended by a band called Bandmate and a music video and I watched it found it awesome and thought hey I'm going to do that I'm going to learn Japanese. It sounds cool. That's the one I'm going to learn. <laughs> oh, so so it was some, some Japanese music that had been recommended to you by YouTube. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm I also watched a lot of anime when I was younger. That's mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people have. Um, but by that point in time, I think for about six years or so, I haven't touched anything in this regard. So I probably forgot forgot almost all about it. <laughs> but after that, I had had to start again, so to speak. Cool, yeah. It's interesting that you say that you found tones intimidating because, of course, there's this other thing called pitch accent in Japanese, but we'll swing back around to that towards the end. So, yeah, how did you end up formulating your Japanese study plan and when did you kind of dis uh, discover the immersion community online? Um, my first plan, I wanted to buy um, a normal grammar book because I had no idea about taikims and all this stuff. I didn't know this existed. So this was the first thing I did. I ordered one online and I don't really remember what happened afterwards. I I was looking through YouTube, looking for guides on how to learn the kanji and how to learn kana and so on and so forth. And I stumbled upon one of your older videos. I can't remember which one. <laughs> I just remember I watched it. I think it was a, a short summary where you uh, present uh, so the, the single steps, what you have to do, taikims, RTK and so on <laughs> and so forth. Mm -hmm. So and that's what I followed afterwards i just uh, finished rtk and so on after i finished all the can and pretty much followed what is what you laid out in that video cool yeah so the, the video that you're referring to actually took down quite a while ago because i've changed my recommendations since back then i think that, that, that i had some pretty out there recommendations like uh, start meditating an hour a day and go through the entire original rtk might have been one rtk one and rtk three and then start learning grammar and stuff like that. So for most people, that's not realistic at all. And they would never be able to put themselves through something so tedious and rigorous. But if I recall correctly from your update video, you know, you're, you have a pretty stoic personality and you're really good at just buckling down and executing. So yeah, what was your experience of, of going through RTK in the traditional way? Yeah, I, I finished it. I finished it in three months. RTK 1, it was the first... One and a half months were fine. I it was kind of fun, but afterwards, last few weeks were pure hell. Um, I hated getting up because I knew I had to do my reps first thing in the morning, or I wanted <laughs> to do my reps first uh, first thing in the morning. Um, yeah, I finished it, but I was really, really relieved once I was done because to, uh, towards the end, three hours of Anki a day or so was a lot. Yeah. Yeah, well, I apologize for making you one of the, the awful victims of the original RTK, but uh, at least I'm assuming it worked pretty well, all in all. Yeah, yeah, it worked. So then, once you were finally free from RTK, then what did things look like? RTK afterwards. Um, I also did Tai Kim's during... I, I started halfway through RTK. I did both at the same time a little bit. So I finished both at around the three-month mark. And then afterwards, I started reading NHK Easy in the beginning. So I, for listening, I st uh, stuck with normal material. I picked whatever I wanted to listen to. For reading material, I went a little bit easier um, and then started with sentence mining from there. And I had a good basis. I think R RTK helped, definitely helped a lot. But I still have, as far as I can remember, I still have a few kanji from RTK that I still have a word in my Anki deck, even though I have around 16,000 cards or so. So there seem to be quite a lot that are not used as much. But yeah, it still helps a lot. Yeah, yeah. I should probably just say out there for anyone who's not already familiar that RTK stands for Remembering the Kanji. And it's a, a book by James Heisig that go, basically teaches you the most common 2000 kanji, uh, how to write them recognize them and a basic meaning of them and it takes about three months to get through this program it's very tedious but it does work if you're consistent and you, you work at it uh, so that's that's what we're talking about here in case you're not familiar but uh when you say listening material that, that you weren't 
you didn't really limit yourself to easy listening material. And what were you actually listening to though? Like anime or? A little bit of a mix right now. I'm a little bit more at YouTube, but at that time I started, one of the first things I watched was the uh, live action variant of Great Teacher Onizuka. Which one? The 90s one or the 2010s one? No, no, no. 2017 or what it was. The newer one. Okay. That's the worst one. Is it 2017? <laughs> I can't remember. There were two. I know one was really bad and the other one was better. Yeah. Yeah. The one from the 90s is pretty good. I, I watched a newer one. Well, if you haven't seen the one from the 90s, I re recommend that one as well. But okay. That's not relevant. <laughs> So we were watching anime and things like that, or, and, well, drama, like, that type of media. Drama, anime, one of the first I watched during that time was Attack on Titan. So pretty much whatever I wanted in Attack on Titan is pretty high level, I would say, from when it comes to vocabulary mm -hmm. and so on. Um, but I still, s stuff like that, I, I try to limit myself to easier material for a week or so, <laughs> but I soon realized something like Shirokuma Cafe or so that it is just isn't for me i can't concentrate it's just boring so i switched and watched whatever i wanted yeah so it sounds like you're just like me i know for some people they prefer to use simplified content even though the the actual content of it is more boring the fact that that it's more comprehensible overall allows them to stay more engaged but yeah i'm just like you i'd rather watch something that i'm intrinsically interested in even if it's technically like above my level and i don't understand that much of it but uh yeah in terms of time how much time were you putting into, you know, all, each of these activities at the beginning, like for the first six months? For the first six months. Um, during the first three months or RTK phase, like I said, about two to three hours of Anki and immersion, two hours of listening. And that was like active or passive or? Active, active. I almost did no passive immersion. I tried to fill out as much of my active time as possible because most of the time when I can't, uh, or no, I couldn't do active. I also couldn't do passive because I was at work or had to concentrate at uni. So all I did, basi basically my passive immersion was non-existent. <laughs> and like I said, first three months, about two hours. And then afterwards I bumped it up, reading not as much in the beginning, maybe half an hour to 45 minutes a day and the rest listening at least four hours plus most of the time. And most of those hours in the evening from eight till midnight around that. So I got at least four hours. Nice. And then after the RTK phase and once those RTK reps settled down, how much time were you spending on Anki a day, roughly? In total, reps only at least an hour. Um, if I also add the card creation time, it took me another hour, so around two hours a day. And like I said, rest immersion, most of, most of the days I got over six hours in total and at least four of them for immersion, but most of the time a little bit more. So yeah, it took a while for Anki to die down a little bit so that I get right now I'm at 20 minutes to 30 minutes a day, but during that time <laughs> up to two hours in total. Of in making cards and repping total? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And how many cards a day were you learning once you started sentence mining? 25 pretty consistently that's a lot um, some days, days a little bit more <laughs> yeah but it worked uh, some days a little bit more some days a little bit less but on average around 25 cool so yeah you're pretty much you were just a real machine at, at nailing this in you had making 25 cards every day doing all your reps and then sitting down and really getting in for you said four solid hours of active immersion so i mean that's a recipe for getting good really quickly so i guess it's no no surprise that uh, you went on to achieve what most people would consider to be really impressive results. But I'm also really curious. So you, you mentioned university, you mentioned a job. So how did you manage to fit all this into your life? Oh, <laughs> a few things. Um, like I said, university, yeah, I don't, um, also I worked on the side, only a part-time job. So not as much, two, three times a week, maybe five hours or so university work. Um, when I, when I do something, I like to go all out and in in language learning as well. So I almost I also stopped gaming for this. Like I said, it was my original intention to stop gaming so I can do something productive. So I really stopped completely. Um, and during my free time, I just I tried to uh, rearrange my schedule a little bit. So for example, normally I take my bike to university or to work, uh, but during, when I ride my bike, I can't really concentrate as much because I have to 
look out for cars and so on. <laughs> um, and I switched this and started walking everywhere. I walked to university and back, to work and back, which took me uh, one hour one way, so two hours alone for work and back. And I used this time to listen to my immersion. And this time was even better when it comes to concentration than active almost for me because no visuals, especially if I had to walk in the evening. Um, and this is the time I made at least what felt like to me the most progress because no outside influence, there were, at least in the evening, not a lot of people around, I can just concentrate on what I'm listening to. So that's one of the changes I made. I try to walk everywhere so I can listen to my immersion in the meantime. Take take my tablet everywhere so I can read if I need to. So that were the main changes. And yeah, reduce gaming and all the other stuff I don't need to do every day. Yeah, that's I mean, totally makes sense. And did you find this difficult to do? Or did it kind of just feel like because of your personality type and you're the type of person who likes to go all in on whatever you're doing, it was pretty natural and, you know, it, it wasn't hard once you had a little momentum going to, to keep going with this really rigorous kind of outlook. Yeah, maybe I'm a little bit lucky when it comes to this because for me it wasn't that hard. Uh, like you said, I like going all out when I when I have some <laughs> have a plan or something like that. So it, on the other hand, it, it was rather fun. I like going extreme. I did a few things when it comes to nutrition and sports where I went really extreme for a few weeks or sometimes shorter sports of time where I <laughs> tried to imitate some studies I've read and tried to uh, do what they did. And so in this case as well, I like when I then every evening write down my numbers, what have I done this, this day and so on. It, that's a lot of fun for me. So it wasn't really hard in the sense that I had to force myself to immerse or anything like that rather the opposite i enjoyed it every day so maybe like i said i'm a little bit lucky when it comes to this because of my personality mm -hmm. but i think if you make a game out of it like i try to do then a lot of people can put in a lot of time because most people like it to see numbers grow to see comparison to before what happened how they improved um or I set myself time goals every month that I wanted to reach so I can see, hey, last month I did a little bit more. Maybe I can push a little bit and get a little bit more, a little bit, a few more hours in so I can get even more time than last month, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So you felt that logging and keeping track of all these numbers really helped you. Yeah, definitely. This helped a lot. Do you think, I've, I've heard, well, most people generally do say that keeping track of numbers helps them a lot, but I've heard some people report that it actually had some kind of negative effects where and they end up like just chasing these numbers and it becomes more about the numbers than actually like enjoying immersion. Did you ever experience any of these negative side effects? Not really. Um, but I agree there. There are some people who can really tolerate it, who like it, who really thrive when they can direct their numbers. It's the same in sport and nutrition. Uh, I personally also for years, for eight years plus, I tracked everything I ate during the day with a scale and so on. Um, so I'm kind of I, I tracking... I like tracking, whatever it is. I like tracking. But if you're a, uh, someone who doesn't like it, for whom it's just a chore, and it makes you less likely to immerse because you don't want to uh, deal with all the hassle, then I don't think you have to do it. I still think it's kind of helpful. But if it's tr uh, preventing you from immersing or anything else, then it's better to drop it. Sure. Yeah, I agree. That I think that totally makes sense. And by the way, I think you have a, a kind of Excel or Google Sheets template that you made for your own. Uh, immersion tracking and or just in general because it's not just immersion Anki as well but uh, I can put the, a link in the description to that as well right if people want to check out the specifics yeah, sure, of sure. how you do it cool cool so yeah I'll do that so yeah so uh, one other thing that I, I was curious about is when you got started kind of going all in on Japanese what was your goal in the end like did you have a specific end goal in mind or were you kind of just like let me see where this takes me in the beginning I didn't have an end goal it was just really yeah. I want to learn a language. I want to do something productive and let's see where this is going. Um, yeah, later on, then I started setting my goal, the N1 in 1.5 years. This was just because I, w once I started um, looking for information in regards to Japanese, I found that there is this test. So I didn't know beforehand. And that was a goal I set on the way, basically, after I think three months or so when I started tracking my stats, I also found out about JLPT and decided that that's my next goal. But overall, right now, the main goal getting as fluent as possible. So 
nothing has really changed. I don't have a concrete goal with the language, except that I, if possible, I would like to go to Japan for a few years. But otherwise, with the language itself, I just want to get as fluent as possible. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So going, like, mentioning that JLPT goal. So you said you want, you had the goal of JLPT in 18 months, and that's including the three months that you spent doing RTK, right? Yeah, exactly. And is there any reason why you chose that that amount of time, 18 months? No, it just happened to be 18 months. <laughs> I started, like I said, in May uh, in May 2018, found out about the JLPT during that time period somewhere. And around three months after I started, I thought to myself, hey, I want to go all in. I want to do as much as I can. So why not set this as my goal? And it just happened to be that the uh, N1 test was the next year, 2019, 1st of December. So I see. So it kind of just worked out that way with the, the timing of the test. Yeah, exactly. And did you change the way that you were studying or approaching Japanese at all uh, with having the JLPT as your goal? Not really, at least not for the first while. I s continued as normal with my immersion and so on until one month before the test, uh, so November 2019. And then I bought three books, uh, two from the Kansen Master series and one where I can't remember the name, but it was just a book with two practice tests because I knew if I want to make a test and I'm a bad test taker, I, wa uh, I want to at least know what the question format looks like and so on. So I have a little bit of preparation. And uh, I finished about 50% of both of the Kansen Master books. And in the end, I mined some sentences from there. And with this information, I, got, I went to the test. But nothing beforehand. I just, as normal, I read, I watched, and whenever there's a grammar point or something I didn't know, I just looked it up. Cool. And so I want to ask you about your actual experience with the JLPT as well, but just talking about the progression up to there. So overall, did you feel for, the, for the, that whole first 18 month period that you were improving quickly? Uh, because also, I imagine there, there possibly you might felt that progress was still a little slow, because I imagine learning Japanese takes longer than learning English given that your native language is German and English is pretty close to German. So were you like, huh, this is weird. I'm putting in so much time, but I'm not picking it up as fast as I picked up English. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. The first year or a little bit over a year, I can't remember exactly, I had a lot of doubts. Um, whenever I was reading, I thought to myself, oh my God, how will I ever be able to understand this? Will I ever be able to follow what they're talking right now? Um, I had this a lot, but after, like I said, a one year, a little bit over one year, I got to the point where I felt like, hey, I already got that far. I guess at that point in time, I was at maybe for most stuff I watched and read 80% comprehension or so. I can't remember exactly. But at that point in time, I thought, hey, I got this far. I've uh, If I continue like this, I'll be able to get the rest as well. So that was, f but for the first year, I really quite often had the problem that I thought to myself that Will I be able to get this? Will this help me improve if I continue like this? But it worked. And after one year, those doubts were gone. Nice. Yeah, I can kind of remember a similar point in my experience where I had made it far enough that I had this intuitive sense that this is the way forward. And if I just keep going on this path, I'll get better and better. And also that there is no other path but to just keep immersing, right? Become, it becomes kind of obvious that trying to practice speaking or things like that, it could never really work. Doesn't really make sense when you understand how language actually works. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so once you get over the bump, I think that that's uh, one, something you can keep in mind from the beginning. Everybody, even if you know this, you will still have those doubts in your mind. But just trying to keep it in mind, keep going uh, as long as you put in the time and you keep immersing, you will get better. In the beginning, it doesn't seem like you are going to get better, but you will. Yeah, definitely. I think that that's really important advice to keep in mind the fact that you're probably going to have these doubts, but that's normal. And if you just keep going, eventually there'll be a time where everything kind of becomes clear. And so, yeah, once you got to the JLPT, did you, was it easy or was it like you passed it, but it was still, you know, a little bit on the edge? <laughs> oh, the first two parts, so the, the first we have uh, the grammar part and the vocab part, and then the reading part, they are all in one. So they were pretty easy, especially the grammar, uh, the vocab part, the grammar part also a lot easier than I thought. I was just able to read over it, uh, get my question, uh, answer the questions and keep going. 
um, and the reading part as well. I was quite surprised because the beginning before I went to the test, I also looked online for some tips, test taking tips and so on. And a lot of websites recommend for the reading part because they say that's the biggest jump from the N2. I can't really compare since I didn't do the N2, but uh, it's a jump from the reading speed you have to have uh, so you can pass the N1. And they, a lot of websites recommended to read only the questions first and then only parts of the text. So maybe the beginning, the end, and then look for the answers. And I didn't do it because I just don't like it. I want to read the whole text. And so I, in the end, I just read the text and then I answered the question afterwards. And I was still able to finish the first section 20 minutes before the time ran out. So that's when I know. also thought to myself, hey, immersion, it really, really works. I am this fast even though they said that the reading part should take a lot longer so it wasn't as hard as i thought it would be the listening section on the other hand i don't know if it's maybe a combination of that i was really really tired <laughs> and the uh, audio itself was a lot of news material even though i read a lot of news i didn't watch a lot of news at that time it changed now i watch a lot of news in japanese or uh, channels about um, politics and so on but this one was a little bit harder i was still able to pass i don't know exactly uh, how good it was i think out of 50 points i got 35 or so but yeah it still worked out in the end so when you finished the test you were pretty confident that you had passed not really <laughs> it was what was kind of i was definitely i was sure of the first part but the listening mm -hmm. like i said i was re extremely tired afterwards i when I, uh, when I went back to the train, I fell asleep right away, so I was really tired. So I thought, maybe, I think I got a lot right, but I'm not 100% sure. So, but it, it seems like it was correct. Yeah, but, I mean, it's awesome that you did pass, because, yeah, being able to say JLPT N1 in 18 months, for most people, that sounds totally impossible, especially considering that, you know, your first... You're, the, all the other languages you speak besides Japanese are, you know, Western languages, European languages that don't have any connection at all to Japanese. And you didn't actually study for the JLPT test. You actually got good at Japanese. And I mean, you did a little bit of JLPT study right before the test. But for the most part, right, you just got good at Japanese. And a natural byproduct of that was that you became able to pass the test, which is the way that I always think people should approach it. Don't study for the JLPT test because even though that might allow you to pass the test, you're not actually going to be getting good at Japanese. And what's the point of that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I also think if you don't want to pass as fast as possible, so you just want to pass eventually, then you don't need those books at all. The main reason, I think, if you want to pass it a little bit faster, there are a lot of grammar points in the test that you don't see as often. So getting a good grasp of them just from immersion, especially in a short period of time, is really hard. Um, if you take a little bit longer, then the chance of you having seen those grammar points before somewhere is a little bit higher. So only if you want to pass it in a short amount of time, then I think it's definitely useful to go through a little bit of prep books just to see if there's anything you missed or you haven't encountered yet. But otherwise, if you take a little bit longer, you don't need any books at all. I'm sure you can pass without it. Yeah, I totally agree. My friend Patrick, who I've actually interviewed on this channel as well, he took the JLPT after just doing learning Japanese through immersion for almost as long as me, so many, many years. But he just recently took the JLPT test and literally got a perfect score, and he didn't study for it at all. Uh, and he showed me the certificate he, with the score on it. So, yeah, it just goes to show immersion is the way. It's really all you need. And this idea that even natives can't pass the JLPT N1, that's completely ridiculous. Yeah, I've also seen this a few th times, but I've, I would kind of strange if a native couldn't pass the test so they can definitely pass it easily definitely would be strange if a native couldn't pass a test that a foreigner can become able to pass in 18 months so yeah so now it's, it's almost been another 18 months not quite right but it's almost been another 18 months since you passed jlpt so how have things been in this kind of latter half uh did you start speaking did you change up your emergent strategy um no, I didn't change a lot. The only thing that really changed is that my Anki time got extremely low in comparison to before. Like I said in the beginning, about two hours a day. Right now I'm down to about 30 minutes. Um, if I do sentence mining, or I do sentence mining basically all the time, whenever I see something during reading, I edit. But right now I don't have any any cards left, so 
the amount of words I find every day is really, really low. Depends on the material, of course. If I read something um, really difficult, then definitely I find a lot of words. But most manga, for example, I maybe one word every two hours or so. So it's really, really low. Um, listening and so on, I just keep going as I did before. No real change. The biggest change in uh, regards to immersion was that I went from only about one and a half hours of reading a day for the first two years I bumped it up and right now I'm at about 50-50 for reading and listening. I try to read a little bit more um, but it keeps at around 50-50 right now and it's getting better every time. The reading it gets easier and easier and the last book I read I had a first time where I consciously noticed this phenomenon phenomenon if you want to call it, during reading in your native language that the almost a, a movie is playing in your head of what you are reading right now. And in the beginning that was basically impossible because you're so focused on trying to remember readings, on trying to put the sentence together, mm -hmm. that there isn't enough, let's say, working space left for your brain to give you this kind of sensation that you're seeing a movie in your brain. And the last book I read, I had exactly this feeling. And so that's one change I that I hadn't had before during the first two years that it only came in the last few months, six months or so. Nice. And so that's like a novel that you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. Gatoru to Monogatari. I can't remember. I, I hope I got the name right. It's just some random name of a country. <laughs> Cool, cool. Yeah, well, novels in Japanese are really difficult. So, yeah, it sounds like you're getting to that point where they're not so difficult anymore. You can actually just read them and enjoy them. And the fact that it's in a foreign language isn't such an impediment anymore. No, no, luckily not. Uh, I really enjoyed this one. And because of maybe I have a positive association now with this because of me realizing that I really have this movie playing in my head. So I want to finish the series. There are about seven books in there. <laughs> and you know, this one was really enjoyable for me. <laughs> Nice. And how far into learning process did you read your first novel or light novel? So I think they're pretty pretty much the same type of thing. Yeah, I, I didn't start with novels because normally even in my native language or in English for that matter, I'm not the type of person to read fantasy books, whatever it is, be it romance or like this one, fantasy novel. Most of the time, my English learning, for example, was knowledge books, so about nutrition, about training and so on. And the first yeah, book in Japan... Yeah, yeah, nonfiction. Thanks. <laughs> and in Japanese, also, my first book was a nonfiction book. I can't remember the exact title, but it was also about nutrition something. And I read it month seven or month six, something like that. I can't, I have to look it up, but I think around, I started in March, no, April, May. I started in May and I read it in December of the same year. Before that, only news and manga. Cool. And so you've been working your way through books that ever since then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I picked up the pace a little bit. So I've read a lot more, in, like I said, because I increased my reading time uh, before a lot more news and manga. Um, but I, every now and then I picked up a new book and started reading it right now, like I said, a little bit more. And it's going faster and faster. I started tracking my reading time for books, how long it takes me. Surely it depends on the book. So for a light novel, I need about eight hours right now to finish it. But like I said, depends if they're a little bit more complicated, a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. And so for listening, do you choose your listening, what, what you're going to listen to or what you're going to watch, depending on what specifically you want to improve? Like, do you ever think, okay, here's a domain of Japanese that I, I still don't understand very well. Like you mentioned, uh, when you took the JLPT, understanding the, the news in spoken form was difficult. Uh, do, do you kind of do that? Or do you just continue to let your interests guide you? A little bit of both. Um, I, most of the time I just watch whatever I find interesting, but I try to incorporate at least a little bit um, of material that's, uh, that's harder for me. So like I said, news, for example, political debates or stuff like that. Um, but luckily I find it quite interesting. So I have a few channels I watch a lot of. So this hasn't been as hard in the beginning. It was harder to get the, so, so to speak, a foothold in this area. Um, but I try to combine it a little bit, not only watching anime, because depending on what kind of anime you're watching, it can be quite easy and I still want to improve a little bit. So I try to combine diff more difficult material, like like I said, like news, with a little bit easier material. But if I end up watching only anime for a day because I found something that I like, I just started re-watching the first um, Dragon Ball series, 
so the first 150 episodes or so, um, then I will I don't feel guilty about it. It's just I try to combine it a little bit. But if I don't end up not doing it, then that's fine as well, as long as I keep engaging with the language. Yeah, that totally makes sense. That sounds very healthy, very good mindset. So and then coming to to speaking. So you, you uploaded a video around the same time that you made your video about passing the JLPT where you're speaking Japanese. And I believe that that in that video, that was the first time you'd ever really outputted, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I haven't done anything before. The only thing I did do sometimes, but also not all the time, was pronounce words on my Anki cards while I was wrapping them. So turn the card around and then try to pronounce it according to the audio or so. But not that often because it takes longer if you do this for every card. I mm -hmm. only did it sometimes. But otherwise, this was the, f was the first time speaking for me. Nice. Yeah. So then just another example of how great immersion learning is because you, I, I would put you at past basic fluency in that video, or at least at basic fluency. Uh, of course, very first time speaking, only learning Japanese for, for 18 months, still some rough edges. But I mean, compared to most Japanese learners, like really impressive. So did you start to work or continue to, to work on speaking since that video? Or are you mostly just still focused on really refining and mastering comprehension. I started with uh, shadowing and pitch focus reading afterwards. Um, I did it for three months or so. I set my I set myself a time limit, or at least I set myself a time I want to reach uh, twenty hours for both, and I reached twenty hours for both. But I stopped for now. The only thing I still do is pitch uh, focus reading. Um, that's what I do pretty much every day. Um, but I don't do any shadowing. Uh, in this sense anymore because I just didn't like it. Uh, it helped definitely. I noticed that my pronunciation got better, but it just wasn't that much fun for me. And so I stopped for a little bit and I'll see when I will continue. But for now, I'm just going to continue with pitch focus reading and my immersion as usual. Um, maybe later on, I'll see how it goes. And so by pitch, pitch focus reading, you mean like reading uh, out loud and intentionally making sure you're pronouncing things with the right pitch accent? Yeah, exactly. So I'm reading, I try to read on websites or so where I can use Yomi-chan, and then I can just uh, pronounce, try to pronounce all the words with the correct pitch accent and look them up if I'm unsure about it. And so when did you first start learning about pitch accent and to what extent have you kind of studied the rules and things like that? I s a little bit from the beginning. So in the community of immersion learners, I think Almost everybody knows about pitch accent, at least that it, that it, uh, that it exists. Mm -hmm. Not everybody does a lot of learning in this regard and tries to get all the information about it or tries to know everything about it. I just a little bit. I knew from the beginning. Hey, there are those pitch, uh, those different patterns, and the words pronounced uh, are pronounced differently according to them. At least when it comes to the pitch. Okay, and I started coloring my uh, Anki cards with mm -hmm. uh, one color for each accent and try to rem not try to remember them in a sense that if I got it wrong, I would fail an Anki card. But I, whenever I had a card for the word that was new, I tried to remember, hey, this one was Heibang. This one was Atamata Kagata. Uh, so a little bit here and there, but not to a great extent. And that's basically the extent of my knowledge for the first two years. I knew there are those pitch accents and I have my colors for them. And that's basically it up until um, now that I started with pitch focus reading and so on, I dug a little bit deeper, but not a lot. Most of the time I try to rely on my ear, try to be able to pick it out from listening. And that's most of what I do. Cool. And when you're listening to Japanese, you find it pretty easy to be able to use just your ear to identify what pattern a word is. Like you could, like if someone pronounces a word with like make as a tamadaka instead of heibon, it's like pretty obvious, like, oh no, it's not like that. It's like this, just your direct perception. Not perfect yet, but it's definitely gotten a lot, lot better. I still have words where I'm, uh, I miss it by a little bit, but for most words, when I hear them, even if it's a complete sentence, I can pick out what kind of pitch accent it is. Like I said, I still make mistakes, definitely, um, but it's gotten a lot easier. I also started using, just because I want to try it out, I started using um, audio cards, so cards with the audio on the front and the mm -hmm. sentence on the back. And for those cards, I also always, I listen to the audio and try to remember what kind of pitch, or not remember, try to pick out what kind of pitch accent the word is uh, so I can see. And sometimes I do fail cards in this regard, but not always. I just 
see if I can pick it out, and most of the time I'm correct. Nice, nice. And so uh, when you're, I'm curious, when you're just reading books, are you thinking about pitch at all in your head or like trying to make sure that your sub vocalization has the correct pitch or are you pretty much not, is that not part of your, what's going on in your head at all? Uh, it, it, I do think about it. I think a lot of people, for most people, I guess it would be if you learn about it and you know there is this and then you know it is important, you will start thinking about it while you're reading. Um, when I read a physical book, which I don't do a lot of, most of the time I read in the browser or something like that, um, then I just try to, with sub-vocalization, I try to get as close as possible if I know the pitch accent for a certain word. Um, while reading in the browser, I do look up words if I'm not sure about uh, the pitch accent all the time, because it's a lot easier if you have something like Yumi Chan or so, and you can just hover over it and get the pitch accent. Um, so yeah, most of the time I think about it and I try to get it in the sub-vocalization, I try to get it as right as possible. Um, so that's why basically I do pitch focus reading most of the time when I'm reading, except if it's in a medium where I can't use something like Yumi Chan and would have to go out of my way to look it up. Mm -hmm. Cool. And so you mentioned that when you first tried, to, when you first looked into learning Chinese, you were intimidated by the tone. So in hindsight, <laughs> how do you, how do you feel about that now? Still intimidated. <laughs> Maybe. Oh yeah? Yeah, yeah. I. I don't know. It's because it's a lot more important. I mean, in, in Japanese, you can get away with, with the wrong pitch accent from context and so on. People will still be able to understand you. But in Chinese, it's so important. And I don't know if I would be able, maybe even if I can pick it out, if I can re replicate it. I guess with a lot of input, you could. But I don't know. It just doesn't appeal to me, The all this. Even though I think ab I'm thinking about, I want to learn another language. And Chinese is one of them. But on the one side kanji and on the other side as well the tones are both that keep me away because i don't want to do kanji again and the tones are kind of intimidating <laughs> well for for the kanji uh, you don't have to do it again if, in fact that's one of the reasons why learning ja uh, chinese if you already know japanese uh, becomes so easy because i mean yeah the characters are a little different either whether you're going for traditional or simplified but you can just use your kanji knowledge to pretty much just pick it up as on the fly as you go. And you don't you don't have to like re go through RTK or anything like that. So I think like, yeah, kanji are pretty easy. And the tones, yeah, they're definitely there's less room for failure, but I think they're simpler than Japanese pitch accent. So I don't think it's so bad. <laughs> but um but we can come come around to your thoughts on on learning another language uh towards the end. But before that I just I'm curious what your so you you mentioned that you did some shadowing and you're still very aware of pitch and focused you know it's it's you're careful to make sure you're picking up pitch information in general but you're not currently doing any actual speaking practice no no I'm not doing anything right now like I said the only thing if you can call it that is really if you pronounce something sub vocalization during reading or so mm -hmm. um, otherwise not really sometimes if I want for whatever reason I do pronounce a sentence or so because I found it funny or whatever, but otherwise nothing at all. I just continue immersing and that's it. So you said that your goal is to get as fluent as possible. And so do, do you have a kind of longer term plan for going forward? Like once my comprehension has reached this sort of level, then I'll, I'll shift my focus to output or how do you think about your plan going forward? I think in this case I'm a little bit influenced because uh, because of my um, experience with English. Like I said, in English I did basically no output at all in the first I don't know I think six years or so after I started with real Im with immersing in English, um, except those two or three times at work. Like I said, for a few minutes here and there, and I still was able to output without uh, any problem afterwards, I'll, except for a little for pronunciation here and there. Sure, that's different. Um, and in Japanese, I still feel that there is, when it comes to comprehension, there is still for me room to grow. And so I don't feel like outputting yet. I will start a little bit more and maybe get someone to talk to uh, once in a while. But right now, I still feel there is a, still enough I can learn. Otherwise, there's still input. Input can still help me to progress from where I am right now to get better before I do start outputting. And I don't really mind even waiting another year or two before I really start to make it a regular thing 
that I try to speak every day or so or every other day. Yeah, that makes sense. So basically, you just feel like you haven't maxed out the gains that come from input. So there's no reason to shift focus yet. Yeah, exactly. I because I if I want to if I start talking, I want to talk right now like I do in English. So I want to be able to talk about pretty much anything. Um, and there would if I right now if I started to talk about a more difficult topic in Japanese, I would still have a lot of problems. So I don't think that that's uh, that I want to do it right now. I still will continue. Politics, for example, I will still need a little bit longer to get to really have a good grasp of this and understand it at a really high speed if there are a lot of people talking over one another and so on. So there are still a lot of um, fields where I can improve. And so I still want to wait. I'll output here and there whenever I feel like it or I have a reason for it. Um, the only other output I kind of do is I started um, uh, texting with a nice Japanese lady. Um, Uh, we text from uh, here and there, so not that often. But in text form, it's a lot easier. I don't have to concentrate on getting the pitch accent right and stuff like that. So I can just type a little bit and get a little bit output that way, even though it's not a lot. But that's for me right now all I want to do. Cool. Yeah. So I find it interesting that based off what what you just said, it kind of sounds like you're thinking very long term in terms of your Japanese ability. But you also mentioned a little bit ago that you're also kind of thinking about learning another language. So what are your what are your current thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, um, for the n next language, I will definitely at least wait another two years before starting it because I want to get a little bit more Japanese under my belt. Um, the longer I wait, the less problems I will have to maintain it. Same in English. If I don't hear English for two, three, four, five days, I have no problem at all because I've been immersing in English for so long. Um, and I want to get to a point where my Japanese is re where I've, most Japanese words or most context I'm listening to, I have it down pat and I don't have to fear that I'll lose too much if I don't immerse as much anymore. So at least until I get to around five years overall, so another two years and a little bit. Uh, and then I'll see, depends on where my life is at that point in time. So that's another factor, but I definitely plan it five years and then I'll see. Cool. So pretty much it's still up in the air, just a possibility, but hard to say. Cool. Cool. Well, yeah, I think we covered quite a bit of, of ground in this interview. Is there anything interesting that you feel like we left out or you just want to tell the viewers? Something interesting. <laughs> no. Um, like I said, I think um, For most people, the biggest problem is not the process itself. It's the motivation to stay with it, to not give up and to believe in it and that you can keep going. Um, a lot of people just stop off the while because they don't feel that they're making any progress or they feel it's too hard or so. And I think that's one of the most important things. Just keep in mind, if you keep going, you will get better. And um, that's what the only rule put in the time and anything else will come. The methods you use if there is something for example like I did with shadowing I didn't like it I felt like I had to force myself to do it every day so then you have to stop it and see that you're making it as comfortable as possible for you do uh, stuff you find interesting do your immersion put in the time and you will get better awesome yeah I think that's great advice so yeah with that I think That's pretty much all, all for this interview. Uh, Stevie has his own channel where he has uh, update videos as well as other interesting videos or advice videos. So definitely check that out. I'll put a link in the description. And with that, thank you mu uh, so much for coming on, Stevie. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you guys so much for watching this interview. If you've watched it this far, that probably means that you are pretty invested in learning language yourself in which case I highly recommend checking out refill.la, which is a relatively new website that I'm making with my friend Ethan to help people take all the ideas that we were talking about in this interview and put them into action in a really detailed and structured study plan. Refill.la is totally free. You can just type that URL in or go to the link in the description and check it out. Uh, we also have a lot of cool exclusive content on the Refold Patreon that I urge you guys to check out as well if you find uh, that Refold has benefited you. So thanks so much again, and I'll catch you in the next one.